we will hear from, from Dan Henry, who is the uh, Vice President Chief Technical Officer for Hearth and Home Technologies. Over here or here? Why don't you come here? Well, thank you, Carol. Um, how many in this room know anything about raising chickens? Cool. Uh, how many in this room want to see us save 22 million barrels of oil a year? I'm going to show you how we can do it. The chicken industry, the poultry industry, turkeys, hog barns, dairy barns, egg laying hens all need heat. And uh, traditionally, about 85% of those operations use propane. Now, how many in this room know that propane is a really great transportation fuel? It'll burn in a car, a bus. The buses here are natural gas. Propane is what? Pretty close to natural gas. So why are we using hundreds of millions of gallons of propane a year to heat chickens when we should be using biomass? When you use propane, because there's five quarts of water in every gallon of propane that's generated through the combustion process, most of the propane heat is unvented and it puts that water in a chicken house. And that wet water, moist air, blooms with the litter and creates ammonia. And you put these one-day-old baby chicks who can make no body heat for the first 10 days of their lives into a really strong ammonia atmosphere. And these little baby chicks have never had a bite of food or a drink of water until the day they're put in there. Now, those baby chicks, for the first 10 days of their life, can make no body heat. So the floor of that house has to be about 93 degrees, and they have to keep that house warm and progressively reduce the temperature until the chick is 10 days old. So they're using a lot of propane. This is the value of pellet heat the confined feeding of chickens, turkeys, hogs, and uh, consumes between 18 and 22 million barrels of oil in thermal energy equivalency via propane. The average chicken house will consume between six and 8,000 gallons of propane per year. There's over 90,000 broiler houses. That's the size chicken you get at Kentucky Fried. They, they grow about 28 to 32,000 chicks from a baby chick to 3.2 pound broiler weight in six weeks. The LP emits 12.5 pounds of carbon dioxide per gallon or 4.7 tons per year per house. The uh, chicken houses emit 40, 423,000 tons of, of CO2 a year. And every 6,000 gallons of LP used adds 7,500 gallons of water to the chicken house. The, the wet litter causes extremely high ammonia levels. And did you know our country exports $125 million worth of chicken feed a year to China? You ever been to China? You see a lot of food with, with chicken feed in it. Now, we can only export the feet that aren't burned from the ammonia. And currently, we only harvest about 20% because the balance gets burned from the wet litter. We can double or quadruple our exports of chicken feet to China, and that would be a good thing. All right. The, the, the ammonia also creates poorer quality for the workers. Now, when you take the price of pellets and you take the price of LP, Per BTU cost of pellet energy is half of what LP is. So when they convert a barn from propane heat to dry heat from, from wood pellets, and they can be agricultural pellets, you cut their energy dollar cost by 50%. But there's another big gain here. Now that you aren't creating all that ammonia, you don't have to turn on these huge exhaust fans one or two minutes out of five to get the ammonia out of the room, which means they're not throwing all that energy away anymore. Now that they're not throwing half their energy away anymore, you've cut their energy consumption by half. Suddenly, you're saving them 75% of their energy cost per house. 
all right, would to replace uh, 6,000 gallons of propane requires 32 tons of pellets. There's a savings of $7,210 a year in just BTU B to BTU energy cost. The other thing that happens is this flock scores higher. Your Tysons, your Purdue's, your Pilgrims, your Cargill's, they contract a grower and they get paid on the score of the flock. The higher the score, the closer to the premium purchase price they get. Most growers are lucky to achieve a 90 percentile. The flocks that we've been turning out with the dry heat have been achieving as high as 103 percent. All right. There is a five-point improvement in feed conversion because the baby chick has a healthier lung. And we have a much, much improved quality of air for the people that work in there. And the neighborhoods that these barns are in and the valleys are in don't stink anymore. It'll create several thousand jobs to produce the 2,800,000 tons of pellets to replace and offset the propane that's currently be used. And all that propane can be used for transportation fuel. Is there any questions? And I must say, I don't know about you guys, but I find this whole area absolutely fascinating in terms of thinking about all of the things that can actually be done. And you'll never think about chickens the same way again, will you? Uh, Our next speaker will be uh, Melissa Van Ornum, who is the marketing manager for GHD uh, Incorporated. And so she also will be talking about biogas, one of my favorite things. Carol, I appreciate that. Um, as she said, my name is Melissa Van Ornum. I'm with GHD. We're an anaerobic digester company based in Wisconsin. So you just heard a lot of great information about chickens, and we have one anaerobic digester on a poultry operation, but the majority of our systems are on dairy farms. So you heard about chickens, and now you're going to hear about cows. <laughs> Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with anaerobic digestion, you can think of it literally as a big cow stomach. So we are growing the same kind of bacteria that you would find in the cow stomach. Cow stomach is an anaerobic uh, digester. Anaerobic means no oxygen. Uh, so what happens is, is we take the manure and we put it into our big concrete vessel and we hold it for 22 days in our big stomach. And we keep it at 100 degrees, same temperature as the cow. Again, growing the same kind of bacteria. And those bacteria do a lot of work for us. They break down the long chains of proteins and carbohydrates and such that are in the manure. And when they break those long carbon chains into smaller chains, they release energy in the form of biogas. And that biogas, in our case, is about 58% methane and 42% CO2. So what we do is we take that biogas off of the digester and in the majority of cases in our projects, we're taking that biogas and running it to engines. And the engines are burning the methane in the biogas. And uh, they're also doing another great thing for us. They're also burning the odor off the farm at the same time. And then the engines power a generator which produce electricity. So we have farmers all around the country now who are selling all this power that they're creating from their manure and putting it right out onto the utility. Um, we also have some other benefits from the system. After the manure has been in the digester for 22 days, we pump it out of the digester and we send it to a separator, a mechanical separator. And we have a solid and a liquid that comes off that separator and they both have a lot of value to our dairy farmers. So the solid looks nothing like manure. It's very fluffy and light, uh, similar to peat moss in consistency. And our dairy farmers have found that it's a wonderful bedding for the animals. So those of you that aren't too familiar with the dairy industry, um, a lot of them spend the majority of their time in barns, which are made of concrete. They have concrete floors. So they'll put some kind of bedding down on the concrete for the cows to lie on. 
because believe it or not, it's when the cows are lying down when they're producing the milk. So the farmers want comfortable cows lying down all the time so they make more milk. So instead of uh, putting sawdust down in the barns or sand, they're now using the solids from the digester. And they found that it's really good for herd health, um, lower mastitis rates, a lot of benefits to it, and the cows love it. So that's one use for the solids. The farmers will generally produce uh, double the amount of solids that they need for their barns. So they have the 50% surplus where they can either sell it to other dairy farmers who will also use it as bedding, or you could sell it as fertilizer. Uh, when you separate, about 35% of the phosphorus goes with the solids and about 25% of the nitrogen. So it's a very good bedding material, or I'm sorry, fertilizer material. Weed seeds are killed, so uh, if you want a product for your garden, this is it. And then the liquid off of that separator is now going into the lagoons that the farmers already have in their operation. Uh, the benefit to the liquid now, though, is the bacteria will convert the nutrients from an organic to an inorganic form. So if you think back to your uh, school days when you were talking about photosynthesis in science class, you'll remember that it was inorganic nutrients that the plants can utilize to grow. So when manure comes out of the animal, it's primarily organic in nature, so the nutrients are organic. When a farmer spreads raw manure, it actually takes the soil bacteria one, two, three, maybe even four years to fully convert the nutrients to an inorganic form. And once it's inorganic, then it's plant accessible. So that's why a lot of farmers are spreading manure, raw manure, in March or November, because you have a hard time spreading it onto a growing crop because it can burn the plant and, and kill it. So now the bacteria do us the great benefit of speeding that process up. So the waste coming out of the digester is now inorganic in nature, so you can put it right onto a growing crop. So our farmers now are holding their liquid and they're spreading it right now, all through the summer, right onto corn, right onto alfalfa. They're greatly increasing their crop yield, greatly reducing the likelihood of runoff. Uh, very little odor when they spread, because again, we're getting rid of the odor when we burn the biogas in the engines. So neighbors are very excited when a digester goes in. Um, so there's lots of really good benefits to the system. We also do a good job of pathogen kill. So E. coli, for example, we're doing over 99% kill of E. coli. Staph and strep are a little bit tougher, but we're in the 90s with them. So God forbid if there was uh, manure that uh, got onto some spinach, for example, nobody's going to get sick. Um, we also do a good job of reducing BOD and COD level levels. So again, God forbid, if it got into a stream, you're not going to kill the fish. So there's a lot of environmental benefits to the digester above and beyond the renewable electricity that I think are really important for um, every person in this country to know. So the other good thing is that it's providing a stable revenue source for our farmers. As some of you may know, uh, we are coming out of a two-year period where the dairy farmers were unfortunately getting a very low price for their milk. It was a difficult time for our dairy farmers in this country. And we had a lot of our customers coming to us and saying, thank goodness we had the digester because it was stable revenue for us and we knew that we would get through the, the low point and get through the storm in the dairy industry. So it helped them ride the volatility in their, in their market. So high level, that's what we're doing uh, with our digester technology. Great. Thanks thank very you. much, Melissa. And now you will never think about cow manure the same way again. So think about how important this last session is in terms of all of these things that you will never think about in the same way. And I think also what is very, very cool in terms of what we're hearing, again, are all of the synergies, all of the different kinds of products that we're getting at the same time while we're also solving problems. And uh, in terms of thinking about odor and runoff, as well as backing out of fossil fuel. And so to wrap this panel up, to kind of put it all together, is Nora Goldstein, who is a board member of the American Biogas Council. Nora? Thank you. Um, it being the last speaker of, of, of the day, I could stand here and sing about biogas or make poems about biogas, but instead I'll just tell you 
uh, try to speak quickly and you'll never think the same way about, let's see, we had chickens and cows and now we're gonna, I'm gonna segue over into sewage sludge, human waste and food waste, so you're never gonna think the same way about that either. Uh, about a year ago, we'll see uh, more, yes, we, a group of uh, businesses mostly uh, recognize, who have been in the anaerobic digestion field for, for many years, uh, recognize the need for biogas to be represented uh, to get the voice out there because there all, are all these various benefits related. And so in April of 2010, we formally incorporated the American Biogas Council, uh, which is based here in Washington, D.C. And in addition to uh, advocating on behalf of anaerobic digestion of animal waste streams, we also advocate on behalf of municipal and industrial waste streams. Uh, and uh, processing them in anaerobic digestion. One of the key benefits of anaerobic digesters is it is an energy tech, a renewable energy technology, but it's also a sustainable waste management technology. And when you're feeding in waste materials that have biogas potential, biogas production potential, on the back end you get the energy, but you also get a, a processed and stable or uh, further processed waste material that has yet another use. So you're getting these outputs that have value. Uh, and uh, distinguishing between some of the uh, waste to energy technologies that you get energy, but you don't get the, the other byproduct streams coming out. So there really wasn't direct representation for anaerobic digestion technologies uh, in DC or in state governments. Uh, so we started with 23 founding members in April of last year, and we just signed on our 100th member this week. So uh, that's a lot, you know, that's significant growth over a short period of time. Uh, in terms of, of legislative issues, probably our immediate focus was on some of the, the tax incentives. There was the 1603 tax incentive that was due to expire at the end of last year. And what that is very beneficial is you can take that or the tax credit, I'm sorry, you can take it in the form, I guess, of a grant so that it, it, you can use it to cover capital costs of the project. And through uh, the extension of, of the tax credits last year, this goes through the end of this year where it's due to expire again, but it really helps get these projects going. Some, they're not hugely, huge capital projects, but these are farms that don't have a lot of extra income. These are some waste management companies that this is, you know, they're sort of fledgling when it comes to organics recycling and they can use these, these funds. The other uh, legislative issue is uh, the REAP funding, REAP, and I'm not even gonna try to, is it Carol? Or it's the Rural Energy Assistance, Assistance Program, Program. Yeah. which is part of the Farm Bill and the Energy and Water Appropriations Committee, Mark, yesterday just wiped it out. Yeah, it's so this down is, to about and, and two and is, a half million dollars. Yeah, and so this has been another critical tool for, uh, you know, farm digester development. And so another thing that ABC is doing is, is really trying to, you know, be up here building education and awareness about the potential for anaerobic digestion, again, as both a renewable energy technology and as a waste, a sustainable waste management technology. Real quick, as far as some of the biogas market issues, uh, in Europe, they have, Germany alone has four or five, 6,000 anaerobic digesters, uh, farm and municipal and industrial. In this country, we have about 170 farm digester projects. There's um, about 1,500 to 2,000, and don't quote me on that number, but wastewater treatment plants with anaerobic digesters. And then you have a lot of industrial food processors putting in anaerobic digesters in there. The closed loop is very exciting because they just capture the biogas that's produced, they put back into their boilers to, to and then they don't have to use natural gas. They can or if they're doing combined heat and power, they can capture the heat and put that back in through the system. So you're really seeing cost savings, uh, avoided costs and cost savings. 
Uh, but then you can also produce renewable natural gas. It's an upgraded biogas that can be fed into the natural gas pipelines. And what we would love to see is more renewable portfolio standards in states recognizing renewable natural gas as a way to meet utility, uh, you know, their, their uh, goals, their 20% or whatever goals. And then uh, this is happening more in Europe, and it's been happening in the U.S. for a while, but upgrading the gas to fleet fuel or vehicle fuel and like compressed natural gas. And so the flexibility of the biogas markets is also a real win for them. Uh, real quick, biogas produces 24-7. You've got to keep feeding that digester. It's a biological system, so it's not weather-dependent, wind or, or sun, and we believe in all those things. Flexibility in biogas use, the combined heat and power is a real advantage. Um, and if I have just another minute, I'd like one minute, great. So these things with wastewater treatment plant digesters is this is existing infrastructure in communities and many of these digesters were built with the capacity to process industrial, higher strength organic industrial waste. And a lot of those industries have moved away or closed down, and so we, we have around, in terms of infrastructure in this country, wastewater treatment plant anaerobic digesters with capacity. And so we're starting to see more and more communities taking in source-separated food waste streams, fats, oils, grease, which are very problematic in the, waste, the sewage collection and wastewater systems. You add them directly to the digester and not run them through the front of the plant, and you get significant biogas, increased biogas production without using a lot of the capacity. Same we're seeing on the farms, adding food waste streams to farm digesters, and you're getting more biogas production. So we have some infrastructure that we really should be using. It's one of those no-brainers. It's not to say you don't have to upgrade a little bit to have that digester take that material, but that's a kind of a no-brainer slam dunk, and I'll stop. Uh, w, it's AmericanBiogasCouncil.org is the website.